it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Interview with a Wendigo. Let's get going. We have a schedule to keep. The southern drawl of Joel Singer called out from the bed of the old van in the driveway. The cold, foggy morning was damp from the rain that had fallen the night before, making the ground covered in frost as the rest of his team joined him. The weather was cold and was only going to get worse, making it very hard to argue with the man. The southern giant was loading heavy equipment boxes into the truck bed. Like his companions, Joel would dress for the weather, flannel shirt with sleeves rolled up to his elbow, tan cargo pants and hiking boots. The man had the equipment to handle where they were going. He was the expert. Uh, let's get the lead out. We have a job to do. Joel called out now with more bass in his voice, finishing loading the van. The idea of spending three weeks with these four wasn't Joel's idea of a good time. By then, an attractive, albeit authoritarian-looking woman in her mid-twenties had strolled to the larger man. The morning sun kissed her skin, and the lightly tanned tone made the shock of the outer part of her blonde hair stand out like honey gold. Her eyes were deep blue, and her eyeliner was pink, with three beauty marks below her right eye. Oh, she stood out, being the only one not dressed for the wilderness. With a voluptuous body, with a noticeably curvaceous figure, a figure one would see in one of those adult movies or fashion magazines. Well, it was more to her, though, than a pretty smoking body, tall, lithe, and athletic. She had a far more muscular physique than her valley girl appearance would admit. Her outfit was a ruffled pink, long sleeve crop top, and a ruffled pink skirt with a slit at the hem. With a light pink slash as a belt with a heart design. Gazzy, we're going to the woods. We're going to be in the mud and dirt, so what? You think maybe you're a little underdressed for the job? Quincy Woods asked in his Boston accent, like gravel, tossing his bag into the pickup. Well, his build was unique, so it made him seem small compared to the other males at only 5'11", well, the likes of Joel who sported a towering height and heavily muscled build. Well, Quincy was of average height and extremely lean, and this man's hard physique and accent gave off the impression of a hard-as-nail street thug. His most striking features were his eyes, distinctly icy blue, and his haggard features, with an unkept brownish beard and a Viking undercut, paired with a messy top knot holding up his long, slick back brown hair. With blue jeans, a light blue short sleeved button up shirt, and a brown t shirt underneath, wearing a blue Sherpa denim jacket for the cold and dark hiking boots for the trail ahead of them. Shut it, Quincy. You only wished you looked as good as me. Cassie Bridges snapped in her valley girl accent, clawing at the two men's brains with how annoying it was. You know she's right. We're heading to the Yukon, Not really going to be there for a photo shoot, Frank called out to Cassie, his hands full with their equipment and a bag on his back. Tossing the rucksack into the truck, Frank turned to his team. Frank Doyle walked toward his three companions, a tall, tan Caucasian male in his mid-thirties. He looked like a movie star, ruggedly handsome good looks, complete with a sharp jawline, a cleft chin, a few beauty marks, and sporting a five o'clock shadow, which gave Frank all the makings of a heartthrob in a rom-com. Short and spiky open hair and squinty hazel eyes. He had a muscular physique, standing at 6'2 and weighing in around 220 pounds of pure muscle. And Frank looked as capable of beating someone's ass as he was of getting a girl for the night. Wearing an army green four-button Henley shirt and tan cargo pants and army boots with black leather tactical gloves on, he was holding his rucksack. Cassie smiled at Frank, giving him bedroom eyes as he passed. Behind Frank, lugging a camera and some sound equipment, was Nolan, setting his gear into the van. He grumbled something under his breath, passing Frank and Cassie with a look toward the pair that was a mix of longing but also disgust. Nolan Harker was taller, at least six feet, and wiry, with cherry red hair and a mod cut with sideburns that made the others think Nolan looked like a ginger Austin Powers, and black eyes behind half-moon glasses which gave off a cold vibe that was hard to shake. Being the leanest of the five, Nolan still had a bit of muscle on him. Well, the young man looked skinny compared to his peers, though. Army Parker, Q 
Cuban-style khakis, linen Guayabara-style shirt, and hiking shoes were his preferred footwear. Ah, the bloody equipment's loaded. Let's get the hell on with this before we all die of old age. Nolan barked, annoyed, his thick Welsh accent adding an edge to his tone. Cassie, you want to drive with me? Nolan asked, his eyes hopeful. Yeah, I'm sorry, but no, I'm going with Frank. You can go with Joel and Quincy, Cassie said, her face showing her disgust at the gall of Nolan, ruining her alone time with Frank. Nolan looked hurt and angry at the couple as they made their way to the jeep. After another twenty minutes of prep work and packing, the five loaded out and started heading to Whitehorse. A long drive for the crew from Prince George, British Columbia. And the sun was going down by the time they reached a motel in a small town halfway towards Whitehorse. With the sun on the horizon, the crew thought it best to rest there for the night. Tell me why we couldn't at least fly to Whitehorse. Cassie whined as she was stiff and cranky from the long drive, and when she stepped out of the jeep she heard popping from her body. She stretched while Nolan went to get their room keys. By the time she'd finished with her stretches, Nolan had returned. She joined the guys, taking her room keys while the guys took the other rooms. There's no budget for it. With all the equipment we have, we were lucky to get over the border. Plus, most of our equipment was shipped to Whitehorse a few days ago, Joel told Cassie, grabbing his bag and heading to his room to get some sleep. His crew followed suit. The night was chilly for spring, and for Joel and the rest of the crew, it was still too cold for them. It was later when Frank walked outside, a cigarette in his mouth, and the moonshine illuminated the parking lot and the forest in front of the motel. He looked back seeing Cassie in a blanket covering her naked, alluring figure. Cassie had invited herself into his room after she figured the others had passed out. Her nightclothes were on the floor, next to Frank's. Even now, with work and staying in a crappy motel, Cassie and Frank weren't able to miss out on a perfect opportunity for their favorite pastime. Frank turned back around, looking out along the wood line. Frank, baby, come back to bed. Cassie called out to him, her eyes burning into his soul. He felt her looking at him, the frosted cloud of his breath visible from the moonlight. The evidence of their lovemaking still hung in the air. Yeah, babe, I'll be there, Frank said, his eyes still fixed on seeing several sets of eyes looking back at him. Sweetheart, let's get some rest. Tomorrow's going to be a long day. And as he said that... Three gunshots broke the silence, accompanied by an ungodly scream that he heard coming from the woods. Frank casually walked back into the motel like nothing had happened. Neither Cassie nor Frank had much of a reaction toward what had happened outside. Yeah, we'd better head to bed. Before joining Cassie in bed, and before long, the moonlight was shining on them. Sleep took them away until morning came. In the forest, the icy cold of night consumed all, hiding the dangers of this subarctic landscape. The ancient forest was silent. No owls, wolves, or any other animal. Ah, the forest was as dead as the grave. In the shadows, four figures were standing around each other, watching the motel and the dead figures at the wood line. The morning was colder than before, almost like the weather didn't want them to go any further. Frank and Cassie emerged from their hotel room. Cassie now dressed more for the weather. A Russian Cossack hat, red and black parka, grey scarf, beige combat pants, a black sleeveless top and a pair of black snow boots. Frank and the others were also ready for the weather. Parkas, beanies, gloves, along with the rest of the gear were now in the vehicle. Frank took a moment, looking out over to the mountains, praying they didn't have to go there. Mount Logan was on the horizon. Its snow-capped peak was shining with the rays of the morning sun. The shadows of the forest in front of them were revealing their secrets slowly as the morning chill came with a fresh scent of pine, white spruce, balsam poplar, and trembling aspen. Let's get going. We're burning daylight, Quincy yelled from across the parking lot. On to White Horse, then? Frank asked with a yawn. Joel shook his head, though. Oh, 
Change of plans. White Horse is off. Pale Valley is off. Isaac and his team are heading to White Horse and will meet us there once their business is done, Joel explained, finishing loading the car. After breakfast at a local diner, the crew was off back on the road, heading to an airfield, heading to Pale Valley, a small village several miles from Old Crow. After several hours and a ton of fast food, high tension and the constant feeling of being followed, they finally arrived. It was late, around one in the morning, and a welcoming party was waiting for them, which was strange, seeing as this trip was so last minute. After exiting the plane, their gear was unloaded and sent to the inn that they would stay at, and a car was provided on arrival. Joel was the first out of the plane, meeting with a group of First Nation members. The first was a young woman, her skin paler than the others in her group, long raven black hair, braided down the back and twinkling dark brown eyes. She was a tall, slender, yet statuesque figure with broad shoulders and modest hips and modest busts, Wearing a turquoise necklace, the, the lights of the airfield building made it give off a dull glow. Her outfit comprised of black snow boots, light blue ski pants, a black shirt, and a red leather jacket. The other was a tall, muscular Native American man in his late twenties or early thirties. He towered over those surrounding him. Even Joel, a mountain of a man in his own right, was almost a foot shorter. Much of his hair was in a mohawk with a long braid in the back and he wore an old grey jacket, worn jeans and leather boots. The other was the older of the three, a man with a weathered scowl, clean-shaven with a steely gaze. His large build made him intimidating, in a deerskin jacket and flannel shirt, a pair of cargo pants, hiking boots and grey gloves. He had long iron-grey hair that was dancing lightly in the wind, and he was carrying a handmade tomahawk and a rifle in the other hand. Welcome to the Pale Valley. Rarely we get visitors around this part, the older man said, greeting the group that had arrived. His voice was slow and smoky from years of tobacco use. Joel offered his hand to the older man. Thank you. Great to be here. Joel took the older man's hand, shaking it, and the old man was stronger than he looked. He introduced himself as Doc Longshadow to each of the newcomers. Yes, I understand you're looking for someone or something, he asked before introducing the two with him. The woman was named Liz, and the bigger man was Jacob. Hmm, Wendy Benoit. She here? Joel asked, which Doc shook his head, but told him she was out of town and would be back later, in about a week. The three then led Joel and the rest of the crew to the old Buckeye Lodge, a small but cosy cabin on the edge of the village. The cabin was big enough to hold all the equipment, and the crew were comfortable with chairs, a couch, and a fireplace that had a roaring fire already started. They unpacked their gear and equipment before going to bed. Well, as the weeks passed, Nolan and Quincy had gone to conduct recon for filming locations, while Frank and Cassie got the living room for the interview and got some supplies. The crew also got to meet more of the townspeople. Now, Doc was the elder in the town, and Liz was his aide, while Jacob was the sheriff. All of them got a tour of the town, got its history, its popular locations, and learned the local traditions. Doc even told them of the festival that would be starting in the coming days. But with the good was the bad. Strange noises, the feeling of being watched, and the way the locals have been acting. Well, the longer the crew is in town, the stranger the town became. They were friendly, but the townspeople here were maybe too friendly, and the way they looked at the five of them, like each one was a cut of meat, well, the whole thing had all the crew on edge. What was worst was that all of them had the same feeling at night. That was until the last week of their stay. Doc arrived at the cabin. Is everyone ready for a drink? Doc asked, taking them to the local tavern. Well, Ten Elks Tavern was at the centre of the town, and while it was small, there was a welcoming aura to it. It looked very local, with pool tables in the corner, dartboards and a pinball machine at the far end. The owners had scattered the tables about the bar, with patrons all deep in conversation, but they turned their attention to the party when they walked in. 
Hmm. Looks uh, cozy here, Quincy said with sarcasm in his voice, getting an uneasy feeling from all of the staring faces. So he opted to go to the bar, telling the bartender to give him a Jack and Coke and keep him coming. Nolan joined Quincy, getting himself a beer and this also for Joel, Cassie and Frank. All of them felt the crowd's eyes on them. Cassie was getting a chilling feeling when she sat down. Joel and Frank were also clearly on edge. Even when they were ordering food, they felt out of place here. Well, these people didn't look at them like they were outsiders. It was more like, well, like they were items on the menu. Ooh. Rabbit meat, horse meat, deer meat. It's like any type you like, they have. What kind of place is this? Cassie asked, speaking in a hushed tone to the rest of the group. Well, this made Joel and the others take quick glances around, assessing the crowd. All five of them tried to hide how on edge they were. Doc was nowhere to be seen, and it was more than a little odd that their host had disappeared on them so suddenly. Luckily enough, Joel had packed for anything, and had given each of them a weapon back at the cabin to carry while in town. After the weeks that they'd stayed, all of them were now thankful for Joel for these weapons. It didn't take long for one of the locals to walk up to their table. It was a balding man with a high widow's peak and thin, wispy beard. A lanky man with a massive beer guts. His eyes were small, beady and dark. Dressed like a hick at a trailer park with his denim jacket, jeans and trucker hat. Uh, he was stumbling across the tavern, making his way towards the table, looking right at Cassie. A putrid smell came off him, making Cassie have to fight the vomit coming up from the stench. Hey, baby, how about you and me have a drink? Maybe have a little fun? The man asked, his words slurred and his breath as foul as the rest of him. Well, Joel and Frank got to their feet, ready to step in. When the door opened and the crowd in the tavern cheered at the person walking in, who came in was a striking beauty, Wendy Benoit, an attractive young Native American woman with bronze eyes and inky, silky black hair. And she had an aura of professionalism about her. Wendy was dressed like she was going camping, wearing an army green women's saddle country shirt jacket, a woman's rose red flannel shirt, tight blue jeans, tan hiking boots, and held a cute orange beanie in her hand. Under her clothes, Wendy had a fairly broad-shouldered, toned torso. It maintained a voluptuous and buxom figure, which was further stressed because she was considerably shorter than the man that was in front of her. The hick smiled, his teeth yellow and rotting, and upon seeing Wendy, he strolled towards the woman. Cold, can I get a dark and stormy? Wendy asked the bearded, tattooed bartender. She was leaning on the bar counter. Her back arched, her ass swaying back and forth, waiting for a drink. You got it, Wendy. Want your usual from the kitchen? He asked, making her the drink and earning a nod from Wendy. She was talking with the bartender when she let out a yelp and shot to her feet with a hand over her butt and a pissed-off look on her face. Yes, the hick had made his move. Being bolder this time, the hick had walked past Wendy and swiftly smacked her ass the biggest shitty eating grin on his face. Damn, girl. Let me really tap that ass. He growled, holding his hand up and flexing his finger in a lewd way. Well, Wendy straightened up, brushed off her butt before turning to face the hick, and cranked her neck before her knee made contact with his crotch, making him drop to his knees. Oh, the hick was groaning in pain and looked up at Wendy, only to find the business end of her knee Nogging him to the floor, his nose now gushing blood. Bobby, touch me again with those greasy hands. I'll break it off and feed it to you. Wendy told the hick. Her boot was on his chest, pinning him down. Well, all took notice, checking Wendy out. Even Frank was, making Cassie huff in jealousy. Me, hey, you boys need a napkin? You're leaving a puddle on the floor, she hissed her eyes staring daggers at Frank. Cassie, are you jealous? Nolan asked, teasing her, earning him the same glare she was giving Frank. 
I just don't see why you four are panting like dogs. She's not all that hot, she said, huffing again. Cassie, look at her. She looks like she should be a model for Sports Illustrated. You look like a model for Playboy, Nolan said, pointing from Wendy to Cassie. Oh, you would say that, you freaking pervert. Cassie spit out in a low tone, making Nolan go silent. Well, you want to try your luck? Go talk to her and get your teeth kicked in, she grumbled. The two went on like this for a while until Joel stood up, heading to the bronze-eyed beauty. Excuse me, miss, uh, but are you Wendy Benoit? Yeah. Who are you and why do you want to know? Wendy asked. Wendy asked as one of the wait staff set her drink in front of her. She looked at the older man with a drink in her hand. Well, she still looked annoyed after dealing with that pervert earlier. I'm a guide to that film crew over there, Joel began, pointing to Cassie and the other three men. We're here to do interviews with locals and tourists on sightings of local legends. We've been told that you know quite a bit about it, Joel explained, getting a bored and annoyed look from Wendy. Oh, visibly annoyed that someone was interrupting her when she was trying to relax, and here this guy was bothering her. Well, take a seat in your Frank and join, but any funny business and I walk, she warned him, her voice luscious, very tasteful and attractive, appealing to Joel like the call of the wild. With that, Joel gestured for the others to join, and they brought their drinks and food, having a good time getting to know Wendy, as she got to know them, but, well, like all things... It had to end as the tavern was closing. Nolan and Quincy were checking Wendy out the entire time, and as the night drew to an end, Wendy stood up, about to head out. Well, oh, Wendy, if you've got nowhere to go, we've got an extra room, plus we haven't done the interview yet. Quincy was hiding his lustful intentions with a toothy smile. Well, Wendy's eyes narrowed at the bearded man. She was no fool and knew Quincy was looking for more than a simple interview, but she took the offer all the same. Fine, I can take you in my jeep. I can take most of you, but the rest will have to wait here for me to come back, Wendy said, leading Joel, Frank, and Cassie, while Nolan and Quincy were left waiting. Part 2 It was late by the time everyone made it to the cabin. The sun had long since drifted past the horizon, and the night had taken over the landscape as everyone agreed to get comfortable. Wendy and Cassie headed to the shower, with Frank and Joel standing guard. Nolan and Quincy were outside checking the generator. The bitter cold would not stop the two men from their goal. While outside, Quincy and Nolan were heading back when they passed the girls' room. Hearing the ladies, Quincy's head cocked towards the window. Well, the boys decided to go into the bushes, mindful of the snow so as not to alarm the women, seeing if they could hide there. Both men looked through the window and saw Cassie and Wendy taking off their towels to change clothes. Wendy was taller and had more muscle tone, and still shone with the water of the shower. And she had those buxom curves and ample bust. While Cassie was a gorgeous subject in her own right, with her athletic yet far more voluptuous figure, with her larger bust and wide hips. Ah, both men were drooling over the ladies. Quincy had his eyes on Wendy like a panting dog. He noticed all the tattoos then on Wendy's body. She had her back to the window, talking to Cassie about how the interviews would go. Wendy's back had a massive skeleton with a Native American headdress with a tomahawk in its hand, with a tomahawk in its hand and two other skulls on either side of the Indian figure. The tattoo started at the middle of her back, up to just the top of her butt, with the word exile written below the Indian. Across her shoulders were the words smile at fear in elegant cursive. Wendy turned around to grab her duffel bag, revealing two more tattoos. A skull with roses around it on her stomach, going around her belly button, and a bone-handled bowie knife and a tomahawk crossed in an X, with writing on the bottom going from her right thigh to her right knee. Well, Cassie didn't have any tattoos the size of Wendy's, only a butterfly on her lower back and an archer on her shoulder. Twenty minutes later, and everyone was in the living room. Wendy sat on the couch in a light blue tank top, with the hem ending above her navel and low-rise black sports shorts. Cassie was in a chair across from her in simple underwear and a long-sleeved shirt that was her pyjamas, and a blanket over her. Joel was at the window, watching as a safety protocol. 
Nolan was holding a camera while Quincy was operating the sound booth. Frank was by the fireplace, tending to the creaking fire. You're looking comfortable, Wendy. Shall we begin the interview? Cassie asked, grabbing a pen and notebook from the coffee table. Well, um, maybe we can start with you or your expertise on the local legends, she added as the camera rolled. Sure, I can start with me, that's not a problem. Wendy began, her chin resting on her hand. Great, so, um, tell us about yourself, Cassie asked, setting her notebook on her lap. Well, I was born in a small village near what would be Toronto. I was so happy then. My papa was a hunter and the chief of my tribe. My mother was the medicine woman for the tribe. Well, those were good times, but like all good things, it must end, Wendy said, a sadness to her voice. She looked away from the group, drawing her gaze to the window for a moment to collect herself. The shine of a single tear was visible on her cheek. Oh, my family, hell. They slaughtered my entire tribe. Who slaughtered them? Cassie asked, trying to hide her eagerness, masking it with a sympathetic look and tone that made her appear disingenuous. Wendy well, clicked her tongue out of annoyance, but gave Cassie what she wanted. All the same, before straightening up in her chair, Wendy's eyes flashed a pale white. <sighs> Laughing bear. He and two others wanted to eliminate the competition. He had a hunting party of monsters attack my tribe and killed them. Well, not only killed, worse than that. She started, her hand shaking as this reopened a wound that Wendy thought was nothing more than a scar. Well, no longer. That sounds horrible. But how are you alive after that? Cassie's words spilled out of her mouth without thinking. Wendy's expression remained neutral, but Cassie could tell there was a slight twitch in the corner of her eye. Wendy looked astonished by Cassie's forwardness. A man saved me. I think of him now as a father. I grew up with him and his other children, all orphans like myself. I remained with my new father for a long time. We had some grand adventures, and I love my new family and still have contact with them. I lived with them until I met my husband. She reminisced at the memory. You're married. You don't have a ring, Cassie asked, her eyes on Wendy's right ring finger. Yes, I am. I have been for many years. I just kept my ring in a safe place when I'm working. My husband's name is Harry, and I met while my family and I were in Quebec. Harry was on a hunting trip after that, and we ran into each other. It was after a run-in with a tribe of Tahinan. Well, imagine savage humanoid cannibals... They may be child-sized, but they're incredibly strong and often attack in large numbers. <sighs> Evil little bastards. They're much like Wendigo, but what's worse is they don't eat women right away. Oh, these fuckers have other plans. Wendy hinted at the vile act before continuing. Oh, Harry was my hero, getting my ass out of the fire. Well, I was an adult at this point, and while no pushover, I was overconfident, way over my head. And this to Hayan had me dead to rights, ready to do the unspeakable. And here comes Harry like some mad animal. Oh, the look in his eyes at those dwarfs. <laughs> Let's just say I'm glad it wasn't for me. While Wendy was trying to make the drama and fear real, her expression was odd, as was her tone. Like this was arousing her. Um, you need a moment. Sounds like your husband's a real man, Cassie asked, her pen in her mouth listening to every word. I'll be fine. Well, he's the best man in the world. I'm his. Now, I've saved him here and there, too. He and I became partners after a while. He's a hunter, after all. I wanted to join him and do what he does. Oh, he had some marvelous adventures, too. Oh, we had a run-in with Lakusa and her ta 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 -kla. Oh, and a really nasty Scudamooch. Oh, good times in those days, when it was the two of us. Wendy said, her eyes filled with nostalgia. What are those? Dwarves or other masters? Cassie continued to ask her a series of questions, not sure of what to make of Wendy's story. Ah, Shudakamuch, the ghost witch, is one of the scariest and most dangerous figures in Passamaquoddy and Micmac mythology, and in America. Yeah, the ghost witch is often said to be born from the dead body of a shaman who practiced black magic. 
the demonic entity then emerges each night to murder anyone they find. Well, you can kill them with fire, but beware if approaching one, simply making eye contact or hearing the witch's voice can bring a diabolical curse down on the unwary. So best to get them when they're sleeping or distracted. Now, Lakusa and her Tatakla, ah, the big owl and the owl women from the Yakama tribe, well, come tales of five supernatural women who resemble giant owls, plus a big mother dwelling in caves by day and flying out at night to prey on many creatures, including humans. Well, in fact, they prefer the taste of children. Uh, legend has it they can hunt humans by mimicking their language. Uh, they're easy enough to kill. Remove the head, but they fly in there fast as hell, she explained, getting a look from not only Cassie, but the whole team. Well, this made Wendy happy. She was leaning back in her seat. You're very knowledgeable. I'm impressed. Now, speaking of monsters, tell us more about what you know. Cassie requested, the professional journalist in her coming out. Well, Wendigo is the commonly asked one. You must not realize how many types there are. Wendy's comment was nonchalant. Well, there are other creatures like Wendigo. Oh, explain, Cassie asked. Uh, to begin with, well, what most people think Wendigo is like deer-like man-eaters that stalk the forest in the northeast, but that's not the case. Well, Wendigo's a humanoid, standing at over six feet. They appear emaciated with bones visible under their pallid skin as a symbol of their unquenchable hunger. Wendigo's eyes are usually pushed back deep in their sockets with milky white eyes and have many layers of crooked and sharp teeth. They have razor-like claws that are used to rip prey to shreds. Well, the idea of the antlers and the deer skull is well, not new, but a more modern than traditional one to some tribes here in the north. The tradition of the deer antlers and skull is still a practice, but for as a hunting ritual, well, most are deer or deer-related animals. There are some who do use other animals like bears, wolves, and mountain lions, Wendy explained, letting Cassie write her notes so she'd understand what she was talking about. So, well, there are more. How is that possible that others are out there? Cassie inquired. Her pen tapping at her bottom lip. Her attention was totally on the woman on the couch in front of her. Wendy crossed and then uncrossed her legs, thinking about how best to word her answer. Oh, creatures like the Wendigo are Wechuge, Kiwok, Jenu, Djunkwa, Achin, Atashia, Chinu, um, Lijrak, Taruksuk. Most are here in northern Canada and Alaska and most of the northern part of the United States. That many? Well, what makes them so similar or so different? What makes these monsters you listed like Wendigo? Cassie continued her questions. To hear that there were so many variations of one type of monster was amazing. Well, this is a long explanation. For starters, most, if not all of them, are cannibalistic and spirit-like, so if they die, they can possess those that engage in cannibalism, now, this is only possible if they're of pure blood, but, well, let's start with the Kiwok. They have a culture. It's like the Abenaki tribe of the northeastern United States. Now, a Kiwok, or Giwakwa, was a giant cannibalistic half-animal, half-human creature that inhabited the forests and woodlands of the area of present-day New England and Quebec well, during ancient times. Now they've spread across the northeast, and some are here in the Yukon. Most legends describe them as former humans whose hearts turned to ice because of either possession by an evil spirit or commission of some dreadful crime, such as cannibalism or allowing a person to starve. But, well, he doesn't feel regret for his crimes. He only feels hunger. That's all he can feel. But they look more like giant humans with animal features. Some have antlers or some have horns or even wings. Well, Wendy felt her explanation was a little long-winded, but she had some venom in her tongue. Next we have the Chenu, another evil cannibalistic spirit. Well, seen as cannibalistic ice giants, or yeti-like, though the two are not related. Now, Chenu is larger than the average man, or getting bigger the hungrier they are. Now, they have sharp fangs which stand out because they chew off their lips. They're hairy too, with thick, ashy hair, with horns. Now, Chenu used to be human, being corrupted by dark magic and cursed to eat people's flesh. 
Their bodies become excruciatingly warm and hair grows. Thus they look like a yeti, forcing them to live out in the snow. There are a few ways to kill a Chinu, usually requiring you to do so more than once. Now some versions say the only way to make sure they're truly dead is to chop up their bodies into multiple pieces. There's no way of destroying the Chinu except by destroying their icy hearts, either by tricking them into eating salt or forcing them into eating so much that they throw up. Wendy continued, seeing that no one was interrupting her. Now, Genu is a wild and cannibalistic hairy giant, normally in Maine, with a culture like the Mihwak, in the same region. Uh, Genu is comparable to the Wendigo and, and to a lesser extent, Sasquatch. There are more mysteries, more rumors. Wendy was reviling at the expressions of her audience. And now we have the Wechuge, a man-eating creature or evil spirit that acts like members of the Atabashkan people. Now, some were people possessed or overwhelmed by the power of one of the ancient giant spirit animals. Now, they start out as savagely animalistic. These giant creatures become a crafty, more intelligent, powerful, and yet somehow keep their power despite being transformed into humans or icy, massive animals. Now, unlike the Wendigo, the Wechuge seek to eat people, attempting to lure them away from their fellows by cunning. But it's made of ice and very strong, and the only way it's killed is by being thrown on a campfire and kept there overnight until it's melted, Wendy said. And the crew was now noticing the underlining venom in her tone. Yeah, the Tariaxuk is a humanoid creature associated with shadows, invisibility, and obscurity. They're the same as any other human being. They have houses, families, weapons, tools, and more. Their culture is similar to Inuits in the same region. Where they deviate from normal people, however, is that they're not visible to the naked eye by looking straight at them. In looking directly at them, they either disappear into the separate world which they occupy, apart from our own, and only reappear when they go in for the kill. They only become visible when they're killed. If they choose to, their true appearance is that of a half-man, half-caribou creature. Aside from the strange condition of their visibility, they can only catch prey while hunting on foot. Thanks to that, they're often mistaken for Wendigo, which is one reason why people think of the Wendigo the way they do today. Wendy then stood up, going to the door, opening it, and letting the cold air kiss her skin, making her sigh. A sizable population here in the Yukon are the Achen, cannibalistic spirits that hunt through the permafrost. Now, they're rare to find unless they're looking for you themselves. They share the tradition of using the skulls of animals during their hunts. So musk, ox, elk, and mountain goats. And as such, you expect the Achen would look like a Wendigo, but at least that's not the case. Uh, they're more robust and hunchback. Their arms are long, making their fingers drag on the ground, and their feet are more hooved. Wendy leaned against the frame of the door. The room was getting unnaturally cold now. Each member of the film crew felt their hair stand on end as the cold nipped at their exposed skin. The moonlight spilled into the cabin, illuminating the room and bathing Wendy in a pale glow, creating both an alluring but also an ominous atmosphere. How do you know all of this? Cassie asked, standing up, exposing her bare legs to the cold. Cassie felt goosebumps forming as she backed away behind the boys. Ah! That's easy. I am a Wendigo, Wendy said, looking at the five. Her once bronze eyes now are milky white. You're... you're a Wendigo? Well, how, uh, aren't you supposed to be thin and wraith-looking? Cassie asked, a slight tremble in her voice. Joel now had his hand on the pistol at his hip, while Frank was putting distance between himself and Wendy. Nolan and Quincy were frozen with their equipment in hand, not sure what to do. Because well, I know how to control myself, well, sort of. I mean, I have to eat a lot, Wendy said, smiling at them, and their smile made their blood run cold. Ah, oh, sit down. If I was going to eat you, I would have done so by now. Wendy was nonchalantly brushing her hair away from her face, and she enjoyed the cold air on her skin. Joel stood up, 
making a beeline towards Wendy. Oh, don't give me that bullshit. You mean to tell me you're a Wendigo and you're not hungry? He was perplexed, not believing a word from this woman. Ah, believe me, it doesn't matter. You'll soon realize I'm the least of your worries, Wendy told Joel, looking outside as a pair of glowing, pale eyes peered in from the woodland. Yeah, looks like we have company. Wendy looked outside, then back to the crew, her eyes back to normal until they could hear the sounds of trees knocking. What? What's out there now? Joel was asking the questions now, gesturing to the others that this thing was getting hairy. Frank quickly passed Cassie some pants and shoes. Nolan and Quincy were recording the whole thing. From the trees, a blood-curdling wail erupted from the forest, making all but Wendy feel their hair stand on end. The wailing made the entire rest of the forest deadly silent. The eerie quiet had everyone in the cabin on high alert. Only Wendy was calmly picking at her nails while the fear of the situation washed over the rest of the group. What? What the fuck was that? Nolan spat out in fear as the man looked close to pissing himself from where Wendy was standing. Argopelder. Wood devils. Look, look, or hell, maybe Madlocks. There are a lot of what you could call Bigfoot tribes here in the Yukon. Uh, Nook Look is the largest, then the Uralia, and Madlocks, but they prefer the term Mangani. Wendy explained this before a second whale, now closer to the cabin, bellowed from the woodland. Uh, you five picked the worst time to come to this place. But Wendy's voice was almost drowned out by a cold gust entering the cabin, and with the gust came the sounds of chanting and voices. Nolan turned the camera to the window, as movement coming from the trees and snow falling as a massive creature appeared from the tree line. The creature had to be thirty feet tall, with white fur covering most of its thin, hunched body. Its head had the skull of a moose covering its face, and its mouth was full of black, rotting fangs. As its massive antlers were approaching, it broke branches and snow was falling to the ground. And Wendy waved at this massive beast. Part 3 Why, well, Dad, I'll be there in a bit. Wendy called out as other monsters appeared. Wendy shut the door and returned to the couch and gestured to Cassie to sit. Now, let's get back to the interview. Wendy was acting casually about a band of monsters hanging out just outside the door. Oh, um, why are those things outside? Is it because of you? Cassie asked. She had the feeling that Wendy was playing games with her and all of them. Yeah, it's as long as I'm in this cabin that you're safe, but you two have been busy, haven't you? Wendy looked at Nolan and Quincy, grinning at both of them. I know you two were spying on me and Cassie. Naughty boys, but you two were set in traps as well. Wendy was jovial, almost gleeful. Uh, how would we have done that? Nolan asked. He was as nervous as Quincy, both men now looking frightened. Well, it shocked Cassie that they would spy on her, but that shock became anger. Both the men were terrified of the Wendigo sitting on the couch, with that shit-eating grin on her face. The two looked to their fellow crew members, seeing that Frank was as furious as Cassie. The realization now that they were in deeper shit than they first thought. The shadows of the woods hid several creatures that had joined the massive Wendigo. There was a group now standing in the wood line. They all had thick black hair on their upper body, leg, and the head was slightly pointed at the back. They also had a long beard that reached its waist, and wore moose skin ankle high boots a moose-skin loincloth with bone or flint knives on their belts, which made the creatures look more like cavemen than Bigfoot. There had to be more than a dozen of them. Primitive weapons, simple clouds with large stones fixed to the end of a thick wooden shaft, and branches torn off trees heavy enough to kill a full-grown man with little effort. Or they had ancient spears thick as a man's forearm, with points of wood and stone sharpened to a razor point, 
These were what were in the hands of these cave-dwelling beasts. The last to appear was a wendigo was gaunt and horribly emaciated, with its ashy grey skin making it look pale in the moonlight. More pale, long, bony arms with hands that were enormous, fingers tipped by sharp claws dragging on the ground, and a large, distended abdomen. Well, their arms and legs were long and slender, and they all stood hunchbacked. Their skull-like faces had short strands of long, stringy hair and sunken black eye sockets and mouths filled with long, jagged teeth. They emitted audible, raspy exhalations, breath a cloud of frost mist, before letting out a piercing scream to intimidate those around them. Wendy was messing with her nails, waiting to see what the humans were about to do. Joel headed to a massive trunk that they had with them. It's go time, people. Get your gear. We have monsters to kill. Joel's words cut past the tension, snapping his crew out of their shock and fear. Joel popped open the trunk, grabbing and tossing a bag at the rest of his crew. Well, Frank's pack armed him to the teeth. The hunting sword in his hand, going into the leather sheath on his side. The 36-inch long, straight, single edge pointed blade sported a serrated saw edge on the back of the blade. The hilt featured a thin knuckle bow to protect the fingers with a trigger to a small matchlock pistol built into the hilt, with deep firing grooves cut into the fuller of the blade. Hanging on a ring on his belt was a single-handed hatchet striking tool with a sharp blade on one side and a hammerhead on the other. The axe was simple on the surface, but Wendy had to guess several secrets were hidden within it. The shoulder holster Frank wore had a pure combat knife attached. A broad leaf-shaped blade sharpened the full length on one side, and from the tip to half on the other side, coated with a dull matte finish to prevent detection at night from stray reflections. The blade would be near invisible in the dark. A pistol was in a holster, and a double-barreled shotgun was in his hand. Cassie and myself will take the windows, covering any blind spots. Frank told Joel as he loaded a round into the shotgun. Cassie had a sword on her too. A cutlass was on her hip, a short, thick, slightly curved blade, and a hilt that had a solid cup to protect the hand. On her ankle was an FS fighting knife with a slender blade almost stiletto-like, a weapon optimized for thrusting. But Wendy was aware of the FS knife's capability to inflict slash cuts to an opponent with its cutting edges. The brass oval crossguard, knurled pattern grip, and rounded ball pommel glinted dully in the lights. The Taurus PT-92 on her hip, ready to be drawn, and next to her was a riot model Ithaca 37 shotgun with pistol grip and tactical sling. But the umbrella beside her shotgun stood out as odd for something to protect a person. But we can handle them if Quincy's shooting hasn't got rusty and Nolan's traps actually work, Cassie hissed still angry at the two men. Quincy sheathed the 25-inch short sword and a pair of brass knuckles in a holster on his belt beside his pistol on his hip. Two rifles were beside him. An Enfield L1A1 SLR rifle was by the window while a high-powered Blazer sniper rifle was being mounted on a stand in front of the window facing where the Wendigo was. Almost said, Nolan. You have those traps set, yeah? Quincy asked, loading around into the chamber of the rifle. Well, they aren't close to them yet, but I have triggers ready for any that miss the traps I have set, Nolan explained, with a trigger in his hand. Nolan was holding a short-bore spear in his hand, with two lugs on the spear socket behind the blade, with each lug a catch to hook an opponent's weapon, additionally acting as a barrier to prevent the spear from penetrating too deeply into the quarry where it might get stuck or break and to stop an injured and furious target from working its way up the shaft of the spear to attack Nolan. Well, the shaft itself was short, but there was a trigger by his hand, so Wendy was wary of that weapon. Nolan's Mark I trench knife rested comfortably in the sheath, its six and three-quarter inch double-edged dagger blade with a black oxide finish, and the bronze handle had a chemically blackened finish too, with cast spikes on the bow of each knuckle. The spikes were intended to prevent an opponent from grabbing the knife hand, as well as to provide a more concentrated striking surface when employed in hand-to-hand -hand combat. 
This was a weapon not just for hand-to-hand -hand combat, but stealth as well. Close to Nolan was a crude club made out of wood. Spikes nailed into the wood near the top and extended a couple of inches from the body. Six spikes, all evenly spaced around the circumference, with one sizable spike at the end of the club. Made to be lightweight and to kill the brain of whatever Nolan swung it at without getting stuck in the skull. The rest of the club was wrapped in barbed wire, adding to its lethality. He had a cord leather strap at the end of the club, and a pistol on his belt, and the M16A1 was hanging in front of him. Isn't that a little much? I mean, a spear and a club. Can you even handle all that? Cassie asked. Like the others, she knew that they were in for a long night. I can. I mean, we have God knows how many of those things out there. No one sounded like he was whining, like this was more of an annoyance than a life-threatening situation. Yeah, man up, Nolan. This is not your first rodeo. Joel growled, marching toward Nolan and slapping him to get his head in the game. Well, Joel's equipment looked more old-fashioned than the rest of the crew. His bowie knife looked right out of the Old West. It's coffin-style, simple riveted wood handle, and brass guard and the clip point hanging freely on his right side. The tomahawk was hanging on his left. A less than two foot hickory shaft was simple with three feathers tied to a paracord lanyard just below the eye of the tomahawk head. The blade of the tomahawk was around nine inches and had a spike on the back end. A bull whip wrapped around his shoulder. The whip was latched comfortably, holding the nine foot throng of the whip. Frank noticed the whip it didn't look like cowhide. There was an M3 trench knife on his leg and the relatively narrow 6.75-inch bayonet-style spear-point blade with a 3.5-inch secretary edge sat comfortably in its leather sheath. The simplified, grooved leather handle and the steel crossguard bent angular at one end to facilitate as a thumb rest. A pair of revolvers on either side of him, adding to the pistol he was already carrying. A Winchester Model 70 was leaning on the chair as they were gearing up. Hmm. Is that a new whip? Frank asked. Yep, made of kangaroo hide. I was told it's better than the oxide one I had before, Joel confirmed, grabbing his Winchester. Joel looked outside. There had to be a good twenty to thirty yards between the cabin and the monsters at the woodline. Quincy set up his sniper rifle, his scope aimed at one of the creatures. Yeah, we have about twenty of those fucking Bigfoot assholes out there, Quincy said, cocking his rifle. The Wendigo walked forward a few steps and pointed at the cabin and roared. Well, what they expected was a charging mass of black fur, but what happened next was pure silence. It was an unnatural silence that had all of them apart from Wendy on high alert and on edge. Well, it didn't matter if this was your first time facing creatures of the forest or the hundredth time. This was the hardest part of the job. Anything could happen, but the five of them knew if they left the cabin, they were all dead, no question. Quincy was looking through his rifle scope. He could see two of the Nook Look, both robust creatures armed to the teeth, like the crew. One was dragging a vicious-looking club, and had a primitive stone knife. The other had a simple bow with a quiver of arrows, which Quincy could clearly see. He never even saw the third ape-man toss the spear that was coming at him, the stone blade of the spear missing the hunter, just grazing his cheek, but leaving a nasty gash and knocking Quincy to the ground. He clutched the wound as blood pooled onto the floor, the red liquid already staining it, while Nolan and Cassie rushed to their partner, seeing him still moving and cursing at the pain and at the beast that had attacked him. "'Quincy, can you fight?' Cassie asked. Her hand on his shoulder, her eyes focused on the spot where the spear had hit him. Quincy nodded gingerly, got to his feet, grabbing the chair, holding onto it to gain his balance back. The wound on his face was still bleeding badly, and drops of blood were hitting the floor. He staggered towards his rifle, only to see a furry arm grabbing the weapon, dragging it out of the window. The sound of bending metal shattered the silence as the nook look twisted and bent Quincy's rifle into a twisted, useless mess. Quincy was swearing in utter pain, seeing what was left of his weapon. Well, thankfully, he had a second rifle, and in the echoes of his old master's words, 
A backup's never a bad thing to have. This thought ran through his head while Quincy got into position, grabbing his other rifle, just as the sky rained spears and long primitive darts, piercing the windows and sticking to the side of the wall. In revenge, Quincy fired off three shots, killing two of the Nook-Look, including the one that had maimed him. This got the response the hunters were looking for. The Nook-Look stopped wasting time and charged at the cabin, swinging their clubs and axes, roaring and bellowing in rage at their fallen tribesmen. They were going to destroy that cabin, and they would feast on the men and use the women before eating them, too. Nolan, Quincy, and Joel provided long-range cover with their rifles, with Frank and Cassie handling the one that had gotten too close to the cabin. Well, the plan was to rain a holy hell of bullets at the beasts, but when the five hunters pulled the trigger, what the fuck? Frank cursed, checking his shotgun, discovering the firing pin was missing. The others checked their guns, noticing they'd also lost their firing pins. What the hell happened to the firing pins? Frank yelled, checking his pistol, seeing that that firing pin was also missing. He tossed his pistol aside and drew his hatchet, preparing himself for a more close and personal fight than he or his crew had been banking on. The charging Nook-Look, approaching the cabin, was about halfway there now, when the front line stopped and wailed in pain, falling to the ground, seeing one of their feet mangled and bloody. Ah, the foothold traps and snares had cut into their flesh, making the leg useless, while others were disappearing, falling into trapping pits filled with spikes, killing those that fell in or, or pinning them to a spot to be picked off by the hunters but the traps could only take out so many of these eight men. Those that didn't trigger the traps had made their way to the cabin now. The first of the Nook-Look, bashing through the wall, winding up to swing at the first person they saw. But they were met with the business end of Cassie's cutlass. The unmistakable twang of steel hitting bone and the wet squelching sound as Cassie cut into the beastman's collarbone with ease. Oh, this was repeated by each one of the crew, followed by the wails and yelps of the Nook-Look who entered the cabin. This action of picking off a few at a time, only without firearms, wouldn't last much longer, and going outside would be a death sentence. Frank looked at the last spot he'd seen Wendy in, and noticed she had disappeared. The realisation had dawned on all of them. They got played for fools, were now in the middle of a goddamn feeding frenzy. There was no way of telling how many were still out there, but they would soon have to face that unavoidable fact. Quincy charged towards a window, his sword aimed at cutting down the oncoming nook-look. When a massive hand splintered the wood, the black fur-covered arms reached in for whatever they could find, and the one that got caught was Quincy. His short saw glistened with the blood of the Nook-Look, with the intense rush of flying through the air, followed by the pain of his body striking a tree. While the impact shook Quincy to the core. Hitting the tree made the sword in his hand drop to the snow, sticking to the ground next to the crumpled heap that was his body. The Nook-Look started closing the distance between it and Quincy. Quincy stirred, gingerly getting to his feet, his shaky hand grasping for his sword. The nook look charged Quincy with its massive bulk, and the ape man rammed him into the tree with the back of his hand. The anguish Quincy felt was unbearable. Oh, he would not lay down and die in front of this monster. So Quincy stood his ground, his leg shaking from the damage he'd sustained. Sword held out at the ready, his other hand filled with the bayonet that was previously on his side, with the sharp point of the bayonet facing the ground in a reverse grip. The look, look was dragging a massive club, taking a huge swing but hitting nothing but air and the tree that was behind Quincy. And while the look, look had swung a mist, Quincy made a few slashes on the belly and torso of the ape man. Blood and viscera spilled to the ground painting the snow in a dark crimson as the Nook-Look fell to the ground in front of Quincy, 
but the hunter had no time to reflect on what he'd done, as before long a band of the beasts charged from the woodline, weapons brandished, their faces twisted into terrifying visages of murderous intent. Quincy knew he was facing certain death, but he would not die without taking some of these monsters with him. In the end, Quincy now battered and broken, his bayonet stuck in the skull of one of the nooklooks, and his sword never leaving his hand. He sat now in the snow. The smell of blood filled the chilled air, but it didn't take long for the cold, rusty smell of blood to be replaced by the pungent smell of something else. Something that told Quincy that he didn't have to look up to know that the Windigo was standing there, and that hot, rotten breath was on him. And here he was, facing death. He couldn't fight back, so he spat at the Wendigo in an irrevocable act of defiance before the Wendigo rushed him and began tearing him apart. Well, the blood-curdling scream coming from Quincy and hearing the wet squelching sound of feeding made the level of danger outside clear. Outside was the kiss of death. But it was also becoming clear that the cabin was not safe for much longer. The Nooklook were only here to weaken them, to chip away at their defences and their sanity. Gassy was losing her nerve, her hands shaking, making the cutlass rattle. Joel was hiding the fear that was bubbling in his guts. His expression remained like stone. How are they going to do this? He thought as he looked towards Frank. Well, Frank looked terrified, and his eyes were shifting to the window. The Nook Look had surrounded the cabin. Their screams were bone chilling, the rattling of their weapons, an act of intimidation in the chilly night air. Every Nook Look was silent now, standing like a soldier awaiting the orders of their master. Joel, Nolan, Frank, and Cassie quickly moved to the centre of the cabin pressing their backs against each other. What the fuck are they waiting for? Cassie whispered nervously. I think they're waiting for something, Frank said, his hand gripping his axe now, his knuckles white with how hard he was handling this weapon. Nolan and Joel remained quiet, neither of them knowing what would happen, but that this could be the end of them. Both men suddenly felt white, hot pain hit them, Nolan was bleeding from his leg, while for Joel it was his arm, making him drop his bowie knife. The blood was dripping off a crudely made knife, a sharpened piece of metal attached to a part of a human jawbone, put together via a piece of string from an animal gut. The hand that held this knife was thin. The skin was pale, as if the one holding the knife hadn't seen the sun in years. The hand was more frightening, with its razor-sharp claws, than the knife ever could be. When the four looked at the figure that was in front of them, they saw it was Wendy, and she was smiling. Now, more like her true nature, Wendy was looking thinner than before, and her smile was even more terrifying, now with her teeth becoming sharper and disfigured. But she hadn't fully transformed, but it had changed her enough to make the image burn into the hunter's mind. She'd be more dangerous now than she was before. Her hair looked dead and her skin was even paler than before. A long claw-like finger wiped the blood off the knife and she licked that same finger. Her eyes were rolling in the back of her head with how nice the blood tasted. Eh, not bad, but not the best, Wendy said. Her voice was now more animalistic than it had been before. She was utterly terrifying and each one of them knew that they would have to kill her to have any chance of survival tonight. Two other Wendigos waited outside. Well, the four of them weren't fools. They were trapped, and they knew there was only one way out. Joel picked up his bowie knife and looked at Wendy. You knew we were hunters that planned this, he inquired. Wendy shook her head. Ah, oh, you're right on one thing. I knew you five were hunters, though posing as a documentary crew was a nice touch, I'll give you that, she said, impressed by what the band of hunters had done. But you had to be nosy here, kill some of my friends. That made it easy to figure out what you were. So it was you who sabotaged our guns, Nolan accused her, quilling his fear for a moment. 
But the fire was snuffed out of his anger, with Wendy merely smiling a sick, twisted smile at him. But Quincy's rifle? Well, I didn't do that directly, but the townspeople here aren't the most trusting of sorts. All they had to do was wait. You thought it was smart to hide them in that trunk. <laughs> Fool, Wendy said, shrugging. Oh, we had to leave one alone for beneficial effects. You all didn't check your own guns. Wendy said. Oh, you've dug your grave. Now lay in it. Her tone was now sober. She grabbed the air and made a pulling motion, summoning a large viking axe. So, who's first? she asked, that sinister smile back on her face. First? Nolan was the first to speak. He stepped up while the others watched their lines of sight. Nolan, you sure about this? That look in her eyes says she isn't playing. She's serious. Cassie asked, her voice low, glancing looks to her friend, her anger from earlier gone. Yeah, I'm sure you three can get out of here while I keep her busy, Nolan whispered back, a hand gesturing for the other three to run. Yeah, a fat chance of escape. The Nook Look have been ordered to kill anyone that's not myself or the other three that will join us, Wendy said, her form human once more, her frame leaning against her axe, making her body curve deliciously. The four hunters said nothing, but their dread was washing over them once more. Three people then walked in. Doc Long Shadow, holding the moose gong. Bobby, the perverted hick from the bar. And Liz, Doc's assistant. Ah, pick your poison, Wendy said, gesturing her hand to one of the three who'd walked in. Nolan sized up the three, rolled his shoulders and lifted his spear, pointed it at Liz's smile, which was wide, wider than a normal person should have, with a mouth full of razor-sharp teeth. Well, Nolan fought hard, but Liz was too much for the man, even with his spear. The spear lay broken with his... The spear lay broken next to his now half-devoured body. Well, Joel fared better, but against Doc, the hunter ended up with a gunstock club to the gut, and Doc, being a mean bastard, was letting him bleed out. Well, Cassie could have had a far worse fate if Wendy hadn't shown mercy, killing her and Bobby too, that man trying to satisfy his lust, not hunger. Bobby took the trench club belonging to Nolan and used the club brutally, relishing his time with Cassie much to Wendy's disgust, before the last straw was seeing a beaten Cassie, helpless, almost being raped by Bobby. Now Wendy wouldn't stand for that. Bobby was soon a dead corpse in the corner, with the marks of a bullet wound on his forehead. Cassie had died from her injuries, but she wasn't being eaten. That's because Frank was the last man standing. He stood between Cassie's body and the monsters before him. The butt of his axe was smoking, but he pushed the head off his axe, hiding the firing mechanism. He was looking now at Wendy. Why? he asked, unsheathing the hunting sword and cocking the gun attached to it. He wanted to see every single one of them dead and their heads on a spike. You hunters... You and your people have hunted and destroyed my people. Well, that's what I'd like to say, but honestly, you just had the worst timing to come after a village of man-eaters. Wendy's answer was a little disappointing, mainly for the hunters and their lack of preparation. Their traps around the cabin had been lackluster, and the security in the cabin was laughable, with only Frank having a working firearm. Joel was spitting out blood, his body feeling every agonizing movement as he got up into a sitting position. Frank, kill them. Do you have... Joel started growling at Frank, but got cut short. As a fresh wave of hot pain overtook him, the handle of a knife in his shoulder. That's enough out of you, Hunt, Wendy said coldly, and then turned her attention back towards Frank. You think you can escape from here, Hunter? She asked, every step she did, avoiding Frank's swings of his axe and swords. 
Frank took the last swing of his axe to meet Wendy's claw to his neck, killing him. The wet, warm feeling of his blood pouring over Wendy's hand, making her heart race from hunger and her mouth water. Without a second thought, Wendy sank her jagged fangs into Frank's cheek with a loud, sickening crunch. The five hunters were now dead and gone, and after Wendy finished feeding on Frank, she took the time to go for a shower, passing Doc and hugging him. It was good to see you, Dad. This was fun, she said, giving Doc a hug. It was good to see you too, child. How is Harry? That boy hasn't been here in a while, Doc asked, letting Wendy go. Well, he'll be here tonight. He had business to tend to, Wendy said before heading to the shower. It didn't take her long to wash the blood off the body. After a good shower, she got a change of clothes when a phone rang. XR Repair. We fix everything from wrecks to relationships. How can I help you? So that was a pretty cool idea for a story. Well, who'd want to interview a Wendigo anyway? Pretty stupid idea if you ask me. Did they get their comeuppances? What do you think? Well, didn't end too well for them, did it? Maybe should have been a bit more careful. What do I know? <laughs> well, that's a nice start to the week, I think. Monday's evening's entertainment are there for you. And I'll be back again. Wednesday, probably, yeah. Having a day off tomorrow. Uh, things to do, places to go, and all that kind of thing. But I'll definitely be back here again on Wednesday. Anything you'd like me to read, anything you've been waiting for, please let me know in the comment section below the video, because I know there are quite a few stories that are ongoing, or things that you want me to read. So, about time I listen to you all again, and you tell me what you want. Yeah? Sound like a good idea? I hope so. Alright, well, till the next time, my dear friends. Have a lovely Monday. And then, well... Sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams, and bye-bye.